What's up everyone? Goldie here. And here we are on a big Friday slate. Uh, big 12 gamer. One of the few that we've had this large this season. A um, lot of games to, to go over, so we're going to probably just kind of get right into it. Um, we do have projections and, and ownership. Initial numbers, of course, disclaimers, disclaimers, etc. Uh, loaded to the site, so keep an eye out for these throughout the day. Um, things will change a lot, because if anything changes with a single one of these pitchers, uh, say somebody gets scratched or whatever, uh, it, it'll change everything. And, you know, so for the most part, um, you know, don't, once again, put too much stock in the early figures. Uh, it's pretty early here in the day still, uh, but we'll get some lineups start to roll in as we get into the afternoon, and then, um, you know, then we can get in a, a real idea as to where uh, all this stuff is landing. But we got a lot of arms on the mound today. Overall, not a ton of uh, raw aces, uh, as it were. Um, and really what I like to do is just kind of take stock with these projections um, and see where the entire market is. Once again, these are the aggregate projections uh, that we're pulling in from the entire industry. Um, several different sources here, and, and we're seeing what everybody's saying, and then we're making some small kind of custom tweaks to them, right? And and then we're just spitting out the number, right? So uh, this is giving us a, a really accurate representation of where the entire market is uh, so far for in the projection models, right? Um, and same thing with the ownership, of course. And so what I like to do is, you know, whenever I'm starting with a slate and, and getting into the projections, um, just kind of getting, taking stock of where we are. Um, what do the, what, what do the projections look like kind of on the whole? And, you know, how high are they on a daily basis? How low are they, et cetera, et cetera. And before we get into individual pitchers um, and, and deciding who we want to target and who we want to play, um, I like to just kind of get our bearings, right? Take stock of where guys are priced and, and compare that to the projection. And of course the ownership when we get into that later, compare that to the projection and, and, and get an idea as to what kind of over, what kind of scoring we might be looking at uh, on the night. And that will give us a better idea as to where we can head with stacks and and certainly with the pitchers on the mound themselves, right? So um, that said, overall, it looks like a pretty, I don't know, a pretty menial sort of scoring night on the mound in terms of raw projections so far, right? 12-game um, slate with the largest projection here is Nestor Cortez at, you know, 18.3. So um, that says that we've just got, I mean, naturally, a ton of guys in the mid-range projected all very similarly here. And this is where we get into the numbers and, and start to decide uh, who we want to play based on matchups and all that kind of stuff. Because the ownerships, for the most part, are all pretty much within range. Um, but overall, just from a raw projection standpoint, you know, if we have a couple of, like, four aces going on the mound, you've got, like, DeGrom, Otani... Um, you know, Luis Garcia, for example, and, and just, like, gets Detroit or, or whatever, uh, and just killer matchups, you'll see these numbers pop above 20 a lot of the time. And in that case, you'll be like, okay, well, I probably want to focus a bit more on pitching, and then that will sort of filter you down to what stacks you want to target. Um, so that said, that's kind of how I like to approach it, just getting our bearings. Uh, what kind of night does this look like, especially on these big slates? Do we want to focus a bit more on pitching, or do we want to focus a bit more on hitting? Generally, it's with hitting on, on large slates, but um, this is a, a pretty good illustration of why and how we can use the projections and the aggregates from the rest of the industry to lead us down that same path, right? Uh, rather than just assuming that, oh, it's a 12-game slate, we just target hitters. Uh, yeah, usually that's the case, right? But um, this is in this case, it's backed up by by some numbers. So that said, um, 
and that spiel aside, let's uh, let's just get right into the games. So I'm not even going to go over, um, you know, kind of a, a, a raw overview here. Like I said, we've got uh, several different arms on the mound, and I think we'll be able to probably uncover some value. So let's uh, let's just get into it, um, and we'll start right here at the top. With uh, Minnesota and the Twins, you needed the Twins yesterday, of course, to win anything on the short five-gamer last night. Mm -hmm. They really tore apart Johnny Brito on the mound. Um, he just didn't have it. He was up in the strike zone, and Twins finally broke out. So uh, that was nice to see. It was Eddie Julian at the top of the lineup um, and uh, the Stone Men. So he was a pretty good value. Correa was one of the better shortstop plays yesterday. Might not be the same today for the Twins, of course. Um, Buxton, he's finally down to 5,200. He's been terrible. Uh, but Buxton obviously has plenty of upside. If he gets on base, he's still going to try to steal. And he gets a lefty today, so if he gets on second base, he might even try to steal third. So uh, do we want to be targeting Nestor? Not really with the Twins. So on a full ga full slate here tonight, probably not where we're going to uh, end up with uh, all that high a probability. Um, but the prices really haven't changed much on the Twins, and Eddie Julian is still 2,000. If they lead him off again, probably not in the uh, in the lefty lefty. Um, since Michael Taylor had a huge night last night, they may lead him off in a in a, in a plus platoon matchup or something. So who knows what they're going to do? They've been experimenting with Donovan Solano. No matter, you probably don't want to be targeting Nestor unless the ownership on him really steams. In any case, he's a good arm. We don't want to go after him. But overall, what's still a, a pretty low upside lineup, even though they went off uh, last night. Louis Varland on the mound for the Twins, 7,100. Uh, we can't really be going after him. Yesterday was different with Joe Ryan. Number one, it was a short slate. Joe Ryan's got uh, a sort of a, a reworked arsenal, and he had good K stuff before. So we can go after the Yankees with guys that have strikeout stuff. And we've seen that a few different times already this season. When they go cold, um, they can they can have some problems. Obviously, Anthony Rizzo was the big piece for them last night, but he was the only one that did anything, right? He had two dingers and a single, and I think uh, Volpe down here had their only other hit, right? So um, – we can target the Yankees with guys that have strikeout stuff. Louis Varland, not one of them. Just a 20% aggregate K rate. In his short stints uh, in last season, spent most of his time in the minors, um, but did get five sort of spot starts. Uh, today, probably something similar. Um, and we're not going to be going after the Yankees with him. Uh, price tag is just kind of in the mid-range. He's got all right workable stuff here, but not really enough to get same-handed hitters out, and that's pretty dangerous when we've got Glaber, Judge, Stanton um, that we've really got to worry about. DJ may be back tonight as well, so he didn't strike out at all. Probably have him back at the top of the lineup. Um, with a, a pretty below average, I mean well below average slider, and nothing in the way of a another breaking pitch like a curveball or a you know, a sweeper or anything to get same-handed hitters out. We're seeing some numbers translate uh, pretty poorly. Now, still a very small sample, just 26 innings in his five spot starts last season, but a 263 average, not horrible, but it's elevated a little bit against righties. Uh, 351 Woba, 228 ISO to righties, which, and just the 19% strikeout rate. 40% hard contact, 1.8 homers per nine. Not something we want to be dealing with with the Yankees. I know I mentioned yesterday in the vid that we could have targeted the Yankees against a fly ball pitcher in Yankee Stadium. Um, and, and, yeah, generally we, we kind of want to do that. Uh, so I think the same it goes for Louis Varlin here today. We could target him as well. He does have a, a fly ball lean. And the, the, the major difference, obviously, is that Joe Ryan's got a 26 and 27% strikeout rate. And two new pitches that the, the league just doesn't have a, a good book on just yet. Um, Louis Varland does not have that kind of stuff in the arsenal. Joe Ryan's got four and five pitches. And, and Louis heavily a four-seamer slider mix. Not going to throw a changeup to righties uh, all that often. And that's really how we want to get Judge and Stanton and um, you know some of these power right-handed bats. Judge, 
actually against a right-handed change, the same-handed changeup, uh, that's his biggest weakness. So if he throws it to him, yeah, he can neutralize Judge here, of course. But uh, overall, doesn't have the the key breaking pitch like the slider or the sweeper that can really uh, wipe out right-handers. So um, high upside spot here for the Yankees and in initial runs doesn't look like they're going to be played much at all. Uh, of course, Judge always pulls in ownership, but um, every one of them is definitely playable. And, and Rizzo got a price drop down to 4,400 from 47 yesterday and gets a, a better matchup here today, I would say. So if you want to get to pretty much all of the Yankees here, I think this is an intriguing tournament stack. Um, a lot of power. Yankees really haven't gone off. And when they go, they're going to go. They're going to end up hitting six dingers in a night, and you're just going to need every one of them. So um, I think it's a viable stack here against Louis Varland, who we're, uh, we're not going to play. You can play everybody against him. Uh, Nestor on the mound, 95 for the Yankees. Um, pretty, pretty high projection here against the Twins. The Twins can platoon with the, best, with the best of them, and they had a good day yesterday. Uh, really, it was just in the couple early innings. They cooled off very, very quickly uh, in the latter innings. But still, we don't want to be targeting Nestor, but do we want to play him at 35% on a full slate? I, I think it's fine. We're going to have to keep an eye on his pitch count because in his last start, I think he only went four and a third, four and two thirds, something like that. So if they're going to yank him after five innings, 9,500 on a full slate, we can go elsewhere at this kind of ownership figure. So I have to keep an eye on that. But overall, we're not really worried about Nestor. The stuff looks great. Um, and when he's fully healthy, he's one of the better DFS pitchers in the game. So numbers are, are fantastic to both sides. Um, hard contact's great. The ISO numbers are great. And obviously the strikeout numbers are great. You don't want to touch a lefty against him. Uh, so it would be a one-off righty or something like a Buxton um, or something like that. I think Carlos Correa is probably overpriced today, 4,900, definitely for this matchup. Buxton probably overpriced as well, but 5,200 is much better than 6,000 Byron Buxton or whatever. So um, if you want to one-off him, I think that's fine. Nobody's going to play him, and he's, and he's got a lot of upside playing in the same small ballpark. So that's fine, but uh, not my favorite getting to the Twins. Would prefer Nestor, uh, just have to keep an eye on the pitch count and the ownership for him. Okay, uh, moving on, Cleveland and uh, Washington. like Cleveland here a, a decent bit. I think they should probably be able to get to uh, Trevor Williams. Don't have ownership on the initial ownership, but Cleveland's never really played. They don't have a lot of upside, raw upside, but this is a good matchup for them. 8,700 for Quantrill on the mound for him. Um, I think he's overpriced. He doesn't have any strikeout stuff whatsoever, and it's very rare that we're going to be playing him Um very rare that we're going to be playing him on a full slate. Uh, definitely not at this price tag. Uh, and, and Washington, they're going to be a little bit sticky. Now, in the early going here, 250 PAs against righties, striking out at a 21% clip, creating at a, a 53 WRC+. Plus. So they, they've they been, like, <laughs> much, much worse against, against righties so far uh, than they have against lefties, which is kind of as we expected. Their, their lineup doesn't strike out a lot, but they just don't have any upside uh, or you know power upside really to to both sides here, righties or lefties. So um, can we can you play him uh, on shorter slates? Sure, but on on a full 12 gamer at this price tag, um, he just does not have the raw upside. You need him to go very deep into a game and suppress and not give up anything, which is possible, of course. But at 8700, I just, most of the upside is just totally priced out, so not going to be dealing with him. doesn't mean I want to play the Nationals on the other side. Um, they don't really have anybody I want to deal with, So, and, and that includes Trevor Williams on the mound. Even at an attractive price tag for him, 5600 he had a good start in his last outing, um, but even still, just raw upside for him is pretty capped, and against Cleveland, this is a horrible matchup. They're not going to strike out. And he gives up a lot of power to the left side of the plate. Not much in the way of terribly hard contact. Not really on the barrel either. He's not going to walk people or anything. So he might be a little sticky to stack against sometimes, especially with a generally low upside offense like Cleveland. You need them to just kind of circle the bases um, and put up a big number for them to get there oftentimes. They're not going to hit it over the wall too terribly often. But 
A 310 average, 364 Wobe, and a 190 ISO with a 9% strikeout rate to the left side of the plate. Over 38 and two-thirds here for Trevor Williams. Uh, no thank you, right? 1.6 homers per nine, so he might not give up balls over the wall, but still very vulnerable to some extra bases, stuff down the line uh, from left-handers, definitely. Bad changeup because he's only throwing 91-93 on the four-seamer sinker combo. Those are okay. Those allow him to survive, but he's still a fly ball lean here, and you got a lot of ground ball hitters and line drive hitters over here on Cleveland. So um, absolutely siding with pretty much all of Cleveland here. Uh, if you fully correlate and get some Cal Quantrill, I mean, eh, okay, but uh, really not my favorite play on the mound tonight on a full 12 gamer, but do like some offense uh, from the Guardians. Okay, moving on, Tampa and Toronto. Tampa's just not going to lose. We just got to accept it. Uh, they're the best team in baseball, and they're going to win 162. And they're going to do whatever. They're probably going to win again tonight because they get Josie Barrios on the mound. We'll get to him in a sec. But um, Rasmus in a 10,000, now we're starting to get kind of out of control um, price-wise. It's not that the stuff is bad. Um, the We're actually seeing the value on the slider really come up. It's because the, the slider is is really incorporating, in terms of the data, uh, a lot of the sweeper stuff that he – um, he started incorporating into his arsenal last year, and he was really kind of the leader. Um, but 10,000, we were paying 6,000, 7,000 for Rasmussen at the time when he brought this pitch in, and now we're paying 10,000 for him. Uh, he's been excellent. However, um, you know, 10,000 is 10,000, and it's on the full slate. Now, I think he's a pretty damn good tournament play because he's only at 5% ownership right now. This number's not going to steam to, like, 15 or 20 um, in, in in most scenarios. So, now, admittedly, this is a pretty bad matchup, but this sweeper over here this is a really good pitch for him, and if he's got it biting, he can blow through any lineup in baseball, um, including, like, the Dodgers and stuff like that, you know, and certainly a very right-handed heavy lineup like the Blue Jays, who've really only got, what, Dalton Varsho and Brandon Belt from the left side, Ka Kevin Biggio, I mean, he strikes out a crap load. So um, we're not really worried. Matt Chapman, he strikes out a, a good bit uh, against righties, and he's sick. He got scratched yesterday, so he, he might not be in the lineup. So they might bring in, like, a, a Sandy Espinal or something to play third base. Um, a little bit stickier, but, you know, it's still a – a pretty, uh, pretty big downgrade, I would say, in, in raw upside from Matt Chapman to Sandy Espinal. Um, you know, that said, I think this is a, a pretty respectable tournament play. Uh, you could fully correlate some Tampa here um, and, and stack them against Josie Barrios. He's, he's just going to, like, the power numbers against lefties are, are still there, giving up two homers per nine in aggregate over his last 95 innings, uh, and it hasn't changed at all yet this season. Um, so they're, they're really struggling with him. He's still pretty damn good against righties. 282 average. That's very elevated, however. 329 Woba, not so much, because he's, he's always had good control. His problem with him anymore is that he's just throwing it right over the middle of the plate. Full 80% contact rate for him and 9.5% on the barrel. Most of this two lefties, but just a 132 ISO to righties. 23% K rate. So still upside to neutralize the right side there. 090 homers per nine. All these numbers are, are mostly okay. But at 090 ground ball to fly ball to lefties, 17.5% strikeout rate with, as I mentioned, the 2-0 homers per nine. Big barrel rate, throws strikes, and is just going to throw it right over the middle of the plate. And, um, I mean, he's just <laughs> – he's not making any changes. So until, until he really starts to tear up lineups and lefties again and really neutralize them by improving the changeup or introducing a cutter or something to try and, and – and keep these lefties um, guessing a little bit more, they're just going to continue to hammer him. And, well, Tampa is one of the best platoon teams in the league. You can still get to every one of these guys. Brandon Lau, cheap again. At least his ownership is going to come down a little bit, but he'll, he'll still be 15% on a full slate. That's, that's not nothing. Um, Wander up to 5,900. Now we're I – mean, this is a little aggressive for Wander. He's a good hitter. So you're going to have to pay for these guys if you want to full stack Tampa again. I think what I'd prefer, just because of the pricing and it's a full 12 gamer here, is just get some short stacks of Tampa. Uh, you want to get to 
some some Josh Lowe or a, a Taylor Walls, right? He'll hit from both sides. Um, Brandon Lau, of course, you're you're not going to leave him off. Uh, Luke Rayleigh, he'll be cheap again. So you can play some of these cheaper guys to make getting to a Randy or a Wander. Yandy at 49 in, in a down matchup for him, um, at least in terms of the platoon. Well, nobody's going to play him. He's not a very good value play, of course, at this price. But he's leading off, and he's shown a lot of pop this in the early part of the season, and he doesn't strike out. So um, you can throw him in in stacks, and he'll be completely ignored. So it's it's a reasonable play to fully correlate the Rays here and play some Rasmussen at 5% ownership. Um, against against right-handers, he's got enough. If he's really got this slider biting in this sweeper, he's got plenty to to chop through Toronto over here. And despite the fact that they, even in the early going, still just striking out at about a 22% clip, creating 123 WRC plus so far, um, you know, those are going to be Toronto's numbers pretty much all season. But uh, Rasmussen has enough of an arsenal here. Good four pitches if you, you know, differentiate the slider and the sweeper. Um, Four-seamer cutter, slider, sweeper, mixing in the curveball as well. Show me sinker. I mean, he's got an arsenal here to to really keep the Jays off the board. So um, I think fully correlating the Rays here. No cho uh, Josie Barrios on the mound for me, even at... You know, we're starting to get to an attractive price tag, but uh, this is definitely not the matchup to be going after him. All right, Angels and the Red Sox. Um, interesting game here. Patty Sandoval on the mound for the Angels. Um, 8500 I don't like this price. And unfortunately, this season, he still just had trouble throwing strike one and getting ahead of hitters. And that has really led to uh, sort of a, a depressed strikeout rate. He just hasn't been able to throw it by anybody just yet. Now, in, in aggregate, over his last 160 innings, he's got about a 22-23% K rate, which is league average, right? And it's fine. 13% swing strike rate's fine. 16% call strike rate's a little low, but his CSW right at 29%. This is all fine. It's just the strike one rate and getting ahead of hitters that is the problem still for, for Patty. And at 8,500, I think we're taking a little bit too much risk against Boston, who this season, short sample, of course, but they've got some some hitters over here that are not going to strike out, and they're going to make it, at least against lefties, make it much more difficult to navigate a lefty lineup, even though they don't have a whole hell of a lot of upside in aggregate. Those hitters in particular being Justin Turner and Rob Ref Snyder, against lefties, they just don't whiff. Now, Kike will still swing and miss a little bit, but at 3600 this is an attractive price tag for him. He's always hit lefties pretty well. Um, Patty doesn't give up a whole lot in, in terms of power and production to the right side, but it's the raw strikeout matchup that takes me off of him at his price tag of 8500 today. So not crazy about getting after Boston necessarily. Uh, seems like it's going to be pretty cool in Boston tonight, um, you know, 55, 60 degrees or whatever. And the the baseball kind of has a little bit of trouble flying when it's a little bit cooler in Boston. So um, not that I want to go after Patty. I still respect the arm and, and like him a good bit. Buck 70 ground ball to fly ball to lefties. Buck 50 ground ball to fly ball to righties. So still getting ground balls and staying off the barrel. Um, if he can just get ahead early in counts, that'll allow him to work to the really good slider and marginal changeup, and really capitalize on these on these suppression numbers, really to both sides of the plate. He's a good arm over here, but the upside for him at this price tag is kind of priced out. So not uh, not really interested in Patty Sandoval. Like I said, not super interested in stacking Boston here. Um, cheap price tags for sure. You want to play a Bobby Dahlbeck who has a weird dual eligibility at first base and shortstop. Uh, he's 2200. He'll be in the middle of the lineup. Um, just to show you guys I'm not making this up. Like, there he is, first and shortstop. Don't think I've ever seen that combination, but uh, sure enough, it's not an error. Um, so he's 22. You play him. Ref Snyder's still 24. Really good numbers against lefties, just in general. And even though Patty doesn't give it up, you can play him. As I mentioned, Justin Turner doesn't strike out. So th nobody's going to be playing Boston, and they really probably shouldn't. Um, early going here, Bobby Dahlbeck with some pop because of this dual eligibility now. Makes him 
far more playable than than he has been in the past. So okay values on Boston, but really not crazy about it. Tanner Hawk on the mound for the Sox, 6,500 against the Angels. He just doesn't have enough K stuff to blast through the Angels here, and he has a big big problem with uh, with lefties and. Well, they still got Trout to go through as well, even though he's not a lefty. Um, and as a as a raw, um, you know, ground ball to fly ball kind of guy, he's got a 2-0 ground ball to fly ball in aggregate over his last 70 innings. That's a good number. However, Trout is a fly ball hitter, and when you're using a four-seamer sinker slider mix down in the strike zone, um, that's not a recipe you want to be going after Trout with. Of course, you got to get through Otani. Still have Renhifo who hits from the left side as well. Uh, so a couple of lefties, Jake Lamb, you'll probably want to ignore, but a um, couple of lefties that they can they can throw out at at Tanner Hawk um, to make it a little bit difficult on him. And of course, you know Taylor Ward doesn't strike out all that much. Uh, downside of the platoon for him for sure. And we've actually seen the run total on the Angels get whacked. They were sitting here at about five, maybe half hour ago. So somebody came in and pounded the under on them. Um, and I think that makes sense. This is not the best matchup for them. Um, of course, you can always play Otani. You can always play Trout. They're expensive. Anthony Rendon doesn't strike out. So that it's a reasonable construction that if Tanner Hawk doesn't have it uh, against lefties, um, as he normally doesn't, you can get to some of these other power bats, like a Hunter Renfro. I don't really want to play him against righties at 4,900, but... Um, that said, I don't really want to play 5,100 Taylor Ward either. You know, so you know, I'm not wild about it in Angel stack here, but it is reasonable as Tanner Hawk is, is certainly attackable with the left side. 269 average, 353 Woba, 175 ISO to lefties, 21% K rate. 13% walk rate to the left side. Not going to walk righties, which is kind of the worry we run into when we play Trout at an expensive price tag. Um, and, of course, Otani in, in the same manner. But uh, a lot of power coming to the left side of the plate despite a very heavy ground ball to fly ball ratio. So um, Shohei, certainly a fly ball hitter against righties, and as is Trout against pretty much everybody. So you can play them, and they're going to be totally off the board. And if you want to attack Tanner Hawk, um, I don't really want to play him. He just doesn't have enough raw strikeout stuff. does have a little bit against right-handers, and the Angels will kind of strike out. But even in the early going here, 340 PAs against righties, just 23% in aggregate. So they're going to be a little bit better against righties this season uh, because the strikeout rates have come down a little bit. So overall, um, not super interested in this game for the most part. Um, maybe a couple of one-off Boston pieces or a couple of one-off Angels pieces, but nothing really, mostly a write-off. Uh, Baltimore and the White Sox, Tyler Wells on the mound for the O's. Um, he is at least healthy. Uh, I think he took a comebacker off his off his knee or his leg or his ankle or something. Um, no matter, you can't really play him against, against the Sox. 18% aggregate K rate. Throwing strikes, stays off the barrel, so it's strong there. Fly ball pitcher at 080, ground ball to fly ball, and that's generally not a, a good recipe against the Sox because they hit a lot of ground balls. Some pesky hitters over here for Chicago, and they hit the ball on the ground. They make some good contact. Obviously, Tim Anderson's out. Um, where are the Sox over here? So, But you've got Luis Robert, who's still a very capable hitter, and hits a good few line drives. Um, Jake Berger's got a lot of pop from the right side. We want to go after Tyler Wells, really with both sides, but you can get to him with righties more so than you can with lefties. Pretty pretty good numbers against lefties because of the existence of a pretty decent changeup, to be quite honest. Uh, the slider is okay. It's you know neutral value relative to league average, but he does throw it kind of over the middle of the plate, and that's because the he, he floats it a little bit. It doesn't really bury it, um, but he buries the slider a bit more. And it's a better pitch than the, the four-seamer and what you want to do with that. The four-seamer for him is, is below league average. Uh, and this is really where he gets in trouble to same-handed hitters. 253 average allowed to righties, 330 Woba, 190 ISO, 15% K rate. So not a lot in, in swinging miss again with the slider uh, or the four-seamer. He's only throwing 92, 94, give or take. Um, not a lot of raw strikeout upside. So even at 6,300 and an attractive price tag against a depleted lineup, 
I still don't think I want to be going after Tyler Wells. Or you can take some Chicago pieces against him because he pitches to a, a 78% contact rate, just an 18% strikeout rate. So uh, he's a good arm. He's an okay arm. Just not a lot of raw upside in terms of DFS scoring. So if you want to play some sh some socks, go ahead. Like I said, you can play some Benintendi. Not a ton of upside there. Really don't like playing him on full slates necessarily. But at 3,800 leading off against a guy that's not going to strike him out, it's okay. Uh, Luis Robert, of course. Andrew Vaughn's got pop. And Gavin Sheets, also cheap. And he makes the Luis Robert 5,400 price tag a little bit more palatable with a $2,600 number himself. So you can play some pop here. Uh, Grandal from the left side. It's a pretty decent catcher play here, 3,300 today. So this is fine. You can mix in an Oscar Colas down at the bottom of the list if you need to. Uh, obviously, Jake Berger, plenty of pop at first and third base as well. So you can play some of the Sox. Pretty off-the-board stack for sure. Mike Clevenger on the other side, you're not going to be playing him. Um, definitely not against Baltimore. These guys are a very dangerous lineup against right-handers. And Clevenger, over the last couple of seasons, ever since he got injured as well, just a 19% K rate. And this is just not going to do it. So when we're going after Baltimore, you need guys that can throw it by them. Because in the early going here, 330 PAs against righties, 25% K rate. But they're still creating 111 WRC plus 184 ISO with a 331 WOBA. All above average numbers against right-handers outside of the K rate. Uh, big walk rate as well, full 10%. So some of these are going to normalize still as we get larger samples. But you need guys that can throw it by the Orioles over here. Because still some young hitters like Gunner, like Rutch, he's still young. Um, Mountcastle, still young, right? Taron Vavra, of course, he played yesterday. Ryan O'Hearn, they just called up, who they may have in the list today. Uh, he strikes out a lot. Um, you know, so th they still have some swing and miss in them, but you need somebody that can throw it by them. And Clevenger, definitely not at 8,300. He's just overpriced for the matchup, so we're not going near him, I don't think. Um, still a workable fastball arsenal, but the breaking stuff and the off-speed stuff is where he gets beat up pretty good. You want to go after him mostly with lefties. Not so much in the way of average, but he'll give up some power. 189 ISO, 21% K rate, and a 1.8 homers per nine to the left side. 33% hard contact rate. Once again, the 30% threshold getting broken there a little bit. So he's on the barrel, 9.5%. So with no strikeout stuff and hard contact on the barrel to opposite handers, handed hitters, uh, that's, that's not what we want to be dealing with with the Orioles. So you can get to the Oast for sure. They'll be a little bit more popular today. Um, than some of the other stacks, or than you would mostly assume on a full 12 game slate, but uh, you can play them. They're they're expensive. You got to get to them. Cedric at at 55 is a pretty decent play. He'll be about 10% you know, owned, give or take. Same with Rutch behind the plate. Always a really good catcher play. Uh, at in the low 5,000s, upper 4,000s, you can get to him pretty much every day. Uh, this is fine. 4,700 for Mountcastle. Really seeing the baseball. So you could play a righty against Clevenger as well. He's not totally immune to righties. Gunner, pretty good play here at 3,900. Struggling a bit out of the gate to, uh, this season, but this is a, a fine play. So, And then some of the guys down at the bottom of the lineup, they will mix in. Um, if you full stack the Orioles, they'll make it a bit cheaper for you. So uh, mostly on the O's here, really no pitching. Uh, if you want to play some some White Sox pieces as well, going after Tyler Wells, he's not going to throw it past him, so that's fine too. Okay, moving on, Texas and Houston. Um, let's try and get through a bunch of this stuff here quickly, but a lot of games. So Martin Perez on the mound, 6,800. You just can't play him against Houston. I, I think we could probably keep this short. 21% carry. He has suppression upside, and Houston has actually gotten torn apart a couple of times this year when they really shouldn't have. Um, but... Martin Perez just doesn't have the raw strikeout stuff to that we almost need a lot of the time to get through Houston. But four and even five pitches here for Martin Perez, uh, cutter really, really good, and a heavy ground ball rate. So uh, we want to – we can target some Kyle Tucker and some um, Jordan Alvarez. They both hit lefties okay. Obviously, I don't want to go out of my way to be playing a, an expensive Jordan Alvarez against a lefty. Um, and, and a good lefty that I respect. I like playing Martin in, in good matchups. This is not a good matchup. but it's So it's 6,200 for Jordan. No thank you. Uh, do you want to play some Chaz? 39. Eh, not crazy about this. Martin Perez ground ball right now. Pushing you know 1.7 and, and 2 to 1. Um, 
I'm not super interested in attacking that with with anybody that's not uh, a solid line drive hitter. And Josie Abreu, 4300 This is a good price tag, however, down here. And I like this a little bit. So you can target some of these lefties. Bregman, 47 He's a fine hitter. He's not going to strike out, of course. Price tag may be a little bit steep for him in this matchup, but you can get to some right-handed uh, Houston pieces here. Their prices are coming down. Jeremy Pena has been moved down to the you know six hole again just because he's he, they're trying to get him going. He's striking out too much. Um, so it's fine to get to some of these pieces, throw in a Jordan or a Kyle Tucker um, or both. It, it's not a bad stack by any means. Cord Jolts has plenty of pop down here um, in the seven. He's very cheap. So this is a workable stack here. I really don't like stacking against Martin Perez in most instances, however. But uh doesn't mean I want to play him, um, even at very low ownership. Like Houston, okay, but eh for the most part. Um, 8,600 on the mound is Luis Garcia against Texas. I think you can attack Texas now. Corey Seager out with a hammy for a little while. Uh, you're going to be able to go after this lineup, and they're, they're going to strike out. Corey Seager really the cog in, in the two-hole there for them, and even though they've got Nate Lowe in the three, um, you know Josh Smith is, is not a sufficient replacement at the plate for – a good, good hitter, one of the better hitters in the league, and Corey Seager when he's right and when he's healthy. Uh, unfortunately, he just hasn't been able to stay healthy for the last couple of seasons. So um, I think we can go after Texas for sure, and market kind of agrees. 25% ownership on Luis Garcia so far. Maybe a little elevated, 8,600. I mean, he's got good stuff. The four-seamer leaves a little bit to be desired. Uh, it's the cutter that's really a good pitch for him. Working in the slider and the change at 8 10%, as well as the curveball, all at about 10%. And those are plus to, to plus plus pitches, plus plus in, in, in the changeup in particular. Um, still has a little bit of, of power susceptibility to the right side. He's a fly ball pitcher. So when he floats it a little bit, um, he can give up a little bit of pop. 245 average to lefties, 322 Woba. These numbers are fine. 213 ISO, however, and just a 22% K rate. 31% hard contact, so it's a little elevated there. Not terribly worrisome at 1.4 homers per nine to lefties. So it's fine. The problem we run into with Luis Garcia is really just throwing strike one and getting ahead of hitters. So he it doesn't translate necessarily into walks, so he doesn't really get himself in, in major trouble. It's because the secondary stuff is, is pretty good. And the cutter is pretty good. He still has enough, even with a marginal to uh, well below average um, fastball at 94, he still has enough in the secondary pitches with the cutter to navigate himself through these counts when he's only throwing 58% strike one. Because he's got a 13% raw swing, swinging strike rate, 15% called strikes, leaving a little bit on the table there, but it's 28% CSW, it's, it's respectable, it's fine. Buck 20 whip because he doesn't really walk people. Stays off of the barrel for the most part, but a little bit susceptible with some extra base hits, um, you know, down the line in a gap here or there, two left-handers in particular. Don't really want to go after him with righties. A lot, lot of swing and miss there. 25.5% to um, K rate to the right side. Still some elevated hard contact, however. So if you want to take a, a one-off or something from Texas, really not my favorite plays here. Um, and price adjusted, I'm not I'm not crazy about this really at all, to be quite honest. I think the favorite price adjusted play here would be either Jonah Heim or Nate Lowe. Uh, Nate Lowe at 4600, I think is a playable price tag as a kind of one-off piece. I don't really want to stack Texas here tonight. Um, I think we're gonna probably end up getting to a good bit of Luis Garcia on the mound. Probably some Astros in very short pieces against Martin Perez, but full stacks, I'm not totally crazy about it. Um, even though it's it's certainly a playable construction. Atlanta and the Royals, Charlie Morton on the mound for the Braves. Um, good stuff against righties still. I mean, good K stuff against lefties as well for Charlie, but uh, 214 ISO and 1.9 homers per nine to lefties. Um, now, the Royals have a lot of lefties here, and they can, they can platoon uh, against Charlie here. But at 91, I think this is a very playable price. Like the Royals, they have MJ, they have Vinny, who's a pretty good play here today, I think, at, at 3,400. 
Uh, pretty decent one-off, to be quite honest. Kyle Isbell, they actually moved him up to the five um, and have moved Michael Massey down. He's really, really cold, is Massey. Uh, he's 2,100, though, so if you want to throw in a little three-man lefty stack of a Vinny Isbell and Massey or Vinny MJ and Massey or something, that's workable. Um, you can always play Salvi against pretty much everybody. He strikes out a lot, though, 30% K rate against righties, and we don't really, really want to be going after Charlie Morton with any right-handers uh, pretty much at all. He'll give up some hard contact, though, so he'll he'll get on the barrel sometimes. Aggregate, 9% barrel rate, a lot of medium plus and, and some hard contact. So he's attackable for sure, and at reduced ownership here at 9,100, I think is playable today. We've been attacking the Royals really all season. So far, they're striking out um, in 350 PAs against righties at a 25% clip. 118 ISO, 262 WOBA, 60 WRC plus so far. Um, so they've been bad. Of course, they've had Grom or, you know, a couple of guys. Bad matchups, right? But Charlie Morton's uh, another kind of bad matchup. So I can, I think we can get to him in tournaments here. Uh, at 9,100, it is a playable price tag. It's not 10,000 Charlie Morton where we start to take a, lo a lot more risk. And these power numbers and hard contact numbers really start to rear their head. But I think this is playable, far more playable at 91 um, today against a, against a pretty hapless Royal squad. On the other side, Brady Singer, 7,600 for him. Uh, median projection looking, yeah, all right so far. Low ownership. I don't think we want to be going after Atlanta. I think you can stack them, as a matter of fact. They're probably going to be pretty off the board today. Brady Singer gives up power to lefties. Not so much in the way of average or WOBA, but... Certainly in, in ISO, 172 is one of the higher numbers of the day. Does have a 27.5% K rate to lefties. So a little bit of a, a weird reverse split here um, for Singer. Against righties, however, he's pretty vulnerable to getting on the barrel. Just a 19% strikeout rate there. Not a lot in the way of raw hard contact on the barrel. That That's mostly coming to the lefties. But we've got Acuna. We've got Austin Riley here from the right side. Um... Sean Murphy's a perfectly fine hitter against righties. Not the plus side of the split, of course, but um, you can get to a little bit of Brady Singer here. Now, at 7,600, you're really scared about, obviously, Matt Olson and Ozzy Albies from the left side. Maybe some Eddie Rosario, 2,500 in the middle of the lineup. Um, Sammy Hilliard, he's got pop, certainly against righties. So they can platoon. And I'm not crazy about playing Brady Singer, but it's an interesting price tag for sure. Very low ownership. I wouldn't be surprised if he has a decent start here against the Braves, because they'll still whiff, man. 24% aggregate K rate so far in 380 PAs against righties this season. Obviously hitting for power, but not creating a lot quite yet. Just a 101 WRC+, plus, uh, 171 ISO, 332 WOBA. So a scary matchup for sure. And even scarier that, that Singer doesn't throw it by righties at a terribly high clip, just 19%. Um, we can still consider getting to, you know, if you land on some Brady Singer teams here, uh, I, I probably wouldn't just X him out of the pools. I think there's enough for him to navigate this lineup. And there's some upside at the price, uh, definitely. But mostly the Braves, Braves stacks, and, and some Charlie Morton on the mound. I don't really want to deal with any of the Royals and targeting Charlie in Maybe some, like, Vinny one-offs or something like that. That's probably my favorite play there. Uh, okay, let's try and get quickly through some of this stuff. Pittsburgh and St. Louis. Yohan Oviedo, he had a really good start against the White Sox. Um, went deep, six and two-thirds. Got, like, 14 ground balls or something crazy. Like, that's a huge number. Um, not too per... Not... <laughs> too per... Uh, too terribly surprising. Um, that, and that's because the White Sox hit a lot of ground balls, right? But uh, Cardinals also going to hit some ground balls. A little bit flatter. Um, they've got some fly ball hitters. And in particular, like uh, a Nolan Arenado or a Goldschmidt. They've got some guys from the left side that are going to hit some balls in the air, too. Nolan Gorman, Alec Burleson, um, Brandon Donovan. He'll probably hit some ground balls, but not the best strikeout matchup uh, in aggregate here for Oviedo again, though. But uh, at 6,000... He's got a really good slider, and it, when, it, when he's got the slider biting, he can neutralize a lot of power to both sides of the plate here. And as we see that in the numbers, 67 and a third, pretty neutral to both sides here. 220 average, 237 average to lefties and righties, respectively, 294, 302 Wobas, 129 ISO, 138 ISO to the left and right sides of the plate. 
having a little bit of trouble striking out lefties, and that's where he might run into some issues here. Just 17.5% aggregate K, K rate, and that's due to the lack of a, a good changeup. So if he could develop this, he'd be a very serviceable arm for the Pirates here because he's got a 25% K rate to the right side. So this is playable. He can suppress, and at 6,000, I think this is a, a viable tournament piece here. Uh, don't expect it to work all that often, but this is a good price tag. And if he's feeling this slider here, you know, he could tear apart the Cardinals because this lineup can definitely go cold. They did it again last night. Um, pretty disappointing overall for the Cardinals, even though they're hitting for some average so far this season. Not a lot in the way of power, so a lot of soft contact from them so far. And he can definitely suppress some of the Cardinals. I think this is an interesting tournament piece. Not my favorite, but if you need a cheaper 6K arm or something on the mound, um, you can consider digging into some Yon Oviedo here uh, against the Cardinals, even in a, an admittedly bad matchup. I don't want to be playing like a Brendan Donovan at 4,800 at the top of the lineup. Um, not my favorite here today. Alec Burleson, 4,000. This is much more playable. You can play some Gorman, sure, at 4,100. And that's because of the lack of raw whiff stuff against lefties that Oviedo displays. So um, certainly the lefties are my favorite plays, but you can always play Goldschmidt. You can always play Arenado. Elevated price tags for them, though, 6,000, 5,600 for those two. I mean, you're finally going to get low ownership on the Cardinals, so if that's what you're waiting for, then, um, you know, by all means, fire away. But a lot of upside in the lineup in general. So don't be surprised if Oviedo, you know, comes out here and gets torched as well. This is a good lineup. But um, I think I'd prefer to side with him if I had to choose between the two, uh, mostly due to the pricing over here from the Cardinals. A little expensive. Jake Woodford on the mound for them. 5K. We're not dealing with this either. 15 per, or 14% strikeout rate. Sinker-slider combo with a Pretty marginal four-seamer, just 93 so far. Um, pitching to too much contact, 83%, and we're not going to deal with that. I like the Pirates, as a matter of fact, as a pretty off-the-board stack here. Uh, you could have gotten there with them a little bit yesterday. They've got some guys with pop that won't strike out. In particular, like a Connor Joe. Uh, Kutch still has plenty of pop, right? And Cabrian Hayes, definitely. 3,300 for Cabrian Hayes. They might lead him off. I mean, m maybe not against a righty, but they could take a shot because he's not... Woodford's not going to throw it by him, and that's really his main weakness. So I wouldn't be surprised here with the lack of or missing uh, O'Neal Cruz at the top of the lineup against righties if they if they just run with Cabrian Hayes. And if they do, at 3,300, this is a very workable piece here, even though it's the downside of the split. I wouldn't be surprised if the Pirates put up a number against Cardinals here tonight. Uh, their bullpen has had to work a little bit. Certainly just coming out of Coors Field, starters not going all that deep into games yet for them. And Jake Woodford probably not long for the game here this evening uh, either. And very attainable to get to Pirates builds with like two expensive pitchers if you want to do that. Uh, full car, full Pirate stacks rather are absolutely in play here. So I think I'd side with them um, into betting markets. I'm not sure what the number is. <laughs> You're getting pretty good plus money. Uh, on the Cardinals here at plus $1.40. I think it's a, a reasonable punt here. Um, Jake Woodford on the mound. Now we're obviously seeing a, a pumped number in the betting markets against Yohan Oviedo. I think there's reasonable uh, consideration that the Pirates could uh, could pop here tonight. Uh, but don't, don't hold it against me if he just gives up nine. Um, so give me some of the Pirates here tonight. I think this is decent in, in tournaments. No ownership literally on, on pretty much anybody. Okay, Mets and Oakland. Cool late slate that we've got going. Let's get into it and try and get through it quickly here. 10-4 for Kodai Senga. He's been fantastic so far. Um, the split has been just in outre outre outrageous and unreal. Uh, wipeout pitch for him so far. Really, really good. Four seamers been good too so far. Um, a little noisy still. Just a couple of starts, of course. Um, but the arsenal looks excellent and... He's going to be a top arm for them, and certainly while Verlander is on the shelf, Scherzer is, uh, well, not very good anymore. <laughs> you know, all of these guys um, are, are really not paying off those price tags yet, but uh, Senga definitely is. Um, great number so far. Only concern is the walks, okay? 12.5% walk rate to lefties in short, short sample, okay? We don't want to put too much stock into this, but maybe something to be aware of. 16 hitters that he's seen from the left side, 29 hitters that he's seen from the right side. Elevated walk rate there, too, 14%. So we need him to throw strikes later in the count, 
Uh, it's not. It's certainly not strike one that he's he's falling short with. It's 69% strike one rate so far um, in the two starts. He's going deep, right? 90 pitches per so far and five and two thirds. So uh, all very encouraging. And you can get to him again. 10-4. We're you, know, you got to pay for him, but this is Oakland on the other side. We have seen that they're a little bit sticky. Um, probably a bit stickier against lefties, um, like a Cole Irvin yesterday, for example. Because in the early going here against righties, 340 PAs, 25% K rate still, 151 ISO, 288 WOBA. So slightly below average numbers there. 85 WRC+, plus, so not nearly as low that a 25% K rate would suggest in the, in the WRC+. Plus. So um, I think this is a, is, is a very playable tournament piece here for Kodai Senga tonight. Um, and definitely on the late slate, you're going to want to get uh, a good bit of him. 25%, 27%, 20, 30%, whatever, um, wherever he comes in at the end of the day, I think it's it's fine. Should he probably be in one in every three teams, uh, one in every four teams that you build tonight? I, I think that's probably pretty warranted. The projection, at least of the, of the upper tier guys, probably makes the most sense for him in this particular matchup. However, he can, if he starts walking people, th like, Oakland is is not horrific here. They can platoon still, and they've got some young and aggressive hitters at the plate. Um, Ramon Laureano hits from the right side. We don't really want anything to do with him. And you know, but Brent Rooker's been tearing the cover off the baseball the last few days. Ryan Noda, a lot of pop from first base. Twenty six hundred, very playable price tag for him. Jace Peterson's got pop. Uh, they'll probably put him in the two hole against righties. Um, Connor Capel, he's got. A, a decent hit tool as well. They'll probably be down here at the bottom of the lineup, but they can platoon a little bit here. Um, not that the splitter is, you know, unlikely to tear apart the A's, but um, they can platoon a little bit and and they can make make opposing pitchers work. And if the walks are at all a concern for Kodai Senga, I mean, you're still paying 10-4 for the guy, so you need him to go a full six innings on a 12-game slate and really tear apart Oakland here. He can do it, absolutely. But um, you know, if he starts walking people, he'll be he won't be long for this game. And Oakland can definitely get to him. So it's it's not just a total smash play, which is why we're seeing a little bit depressed uh, ownership here in the early runs. That said, you know, I, I still side with um, Senga for sure, and would prefer getting to him in in you know a pretty healthy amount. Um, James Caprillion on the mound on the other side for the A's. Uh, I mean, we're going to be stacking the Mets here, definitely on the late slate. You can you can stack the Mets on the main slate as well. Cap, he's frustrating to stack against sometimes. He just often just doesn't give up enough power. I, I don't know how he does it. It's probably just because he's got five pitches that he throws, all at a pretty healthy amount, uh, and he just keeps guys off balance. But he walks people. And he's on the barrel at a full 8.5% clip. I mean, you're not playing him. Definitely not against the Mets. I think this is one of the, the spots that you, we can get to Mets stacks. Um, and they could realize some power here. Because he's not going to throw it by, by them, his cap. And he's, he's pitched to a full 80% contact here. I mean, he's a fly ball pitcher. But this game is in Oakland, so he'll be able to suppress a little bit. Um, but to walks, man. Anything over... 9%, it starts to get pretty worrisome for me. Um, he did get beat up, I think, pretty good in his last start. Um, don't remember exactly off the top of my head. But you can get to him with both righties and lefties. So don't shy away from a Pete Alonzo or anything like that. Uh, anybody hitting from the right side. If you're stacking the Mets, go ahead. 186 ISO to lefties, 201 ISO to righties. As I mentioned, very low strikeout rate, sub 20%, just 15% to lefties. So, um very attackable to both sides, but doesn't really translate into homers. 1.2 and 1.3 homers per nine to the lefties and the righties, respectively, even though he is a fly ball pitcher. It's it's because he's pitching most of his games in a big ballpark in Oakland that suppresses a lot of that um, that raw contact and heavy air in the bay there and in a big ballpark. Cool weather. Uh, usually in, in night games, certainly with Oakland. So uh, there's hard contact, though, 34% on the barrel to to righties and 32% to lefties. So you can get to him definitely. And if he starts walking people, the Mets could put up a crooked, crooked number here uh, pretty quickly. I think you can get to some cool offense uh, in this game. 
on the late slate. I mean, I'm not playing Oakland on the main slate, but you could play some Oakland pieces uh, on the late slate for sure and attack Kodai Senga where her, he'll almost certainly be like 50 or 60% owned. But like the Mets here, a pretty good bit. Uh, Milwaukee and San Diego. Um, Eric Lauer on the mound. And Michael Walker for the Padres. Uh, Eric Lauer, I, I just can't play him. Certainly in a bad strikeout matchup. Um, yeah, he has some some strikeout stuff, and he's got enough to navigate, but he still just gives up too much power to the right to the righties. He's at 202 ISO and 1.7 homers per nine with a 37.5 hard contact rate uh, to, to right-handers. I mean, with an 065 ground ball to fly ball, it's just way too high in both of those metrics. Um I mean, 1.7 homers per nine is a big, big number here. So the same looks to be continuing. He got beat up by the Cardinals um, in his last start as he got beat up last year by, by righties where he gave up a lot of home runs, I think the most in the league. So we can target him again uh, with some of the Padres over here. Manny, definitely, 4,900. That's a pretty good price tag and looks to be on the uh, plus side of the ownership spectrum here tonight. It's up 10%. It's a good number. Xander, they might lead him off. 5,100, also a pretty good number. You can get to some of the Padres tonight. Not my favorite to stack. They're kind of awkward, still missing Tatis. Uh, he should be back, I believe, next week. But um, you can get to some Manny, some Bogarts. You want to play a Nelson Cruz? You can play him on the late slate for sure. You want to play some Hassan Kim on the late slate for sure. Probably not my favorite stack uh, on the on the main here. So if their ownership pumps at all, it kind of takes me off of them. But you play Soto for sure. Um, he, like he's been terrible pretty much since he got to San Diego. But um, 5200, we're starting to at least get an attractive price tag on the guy. So he'll hit lefties, okay. And as a matter of fact, Eric Lauer is not going to throw it by him necessarily. 20, just a 22% strikeout to lefties, whereas a 24% strikeout rate to righties. So um, won't really give up power to the left side. Of, of course, he's he's better to lefties, undoubtedly. But um, you can you can play Soto if you want to play a Manny Soto Bogart type of team. I think it's a fine three man. A lot of upside for sure, and because Lauer can definitely give up uh, a good bit of power. Michael Walk on the mound for the Pods, um, 8100 for him. He had a killer last start. I don't know where the hell that came from. Um, is that likely to continue against the Brewers? I mean, it could. They're striking out. Really at a kind of depressed clip, kind of surprising number. It kind of caught me off guard here, but at just a 22.5% K rate against righties so far this season, 380 PAs, creating still 112 WRC plus with a 161 ISO and 346 Woba. Obviously, they can platoon. It looks like Yelich has maybe realized that he has a bat in his hands. Price is coming down, and he's actually been okay recently. Um, the and do we want to go after Michael Walker? I think we can a little bit with some contrarian Brewer stacks. Definitely a good late slate play. They're, nobody's going to play these guys on the main slate. So they are, they're within consideration. You can play Willie for sure. 4800 is not my favorite price tag, but look at Rowdy down here at 3000 All the pop in the world. Garrett Mitchell still attainable, 2700 You can play Willie behind the plate. Uh, Willie Contreras, that is. Uh, 3800 Brian Anderson, plenty of pop. Bryce Terang, a lot of pop, a lot of, a lot of speed. Um, Joey Weimer as well. He'll turn the lineup over. So this is a, a workable stack down here for the Brewers. Um, how do we want to go after Waka? Well, it's been mostly with righties over the last year and a half or so. 189 ISO, 319 Woba to the right side, 19% strikeout rate, 33% hard contact, not translating to homer so much. And, you know, it's a, it's a night game in, in San Diego. It's not like uh, the ball's just going to fly, but, um, he'll still give up a, a good bit of contact, full 80%, not it, not terribly concerning walk rate or anything like that, just a, a 6%. Throwing strikes, uh, but he is on the barrel here, and that's really what we want to target. So I think we can get to the Brewers as well. I'd prefer them as, as full stacks than to the Padres, but um, you know you could, you could definitely get to some Milwaukee here. They have a lot of upside, and I'm not super interested in, in playing Waka against a team that really hasn't displayed a full strikeout rate um, or a really attackable strikeout rate, that is, uh, yet this season, as I mentioned, just 22.5% against righty so far. So at 8,100, I think the price tag is a little elevated for me. 14% ownership on a main slate here, definitely elevated for me. Um, not my favorite play because he's on the barrel so much. I'd rather get to the Brewers here. So no pitching, I don't think, in, in this game here. Would prefer mostly offense. Okay, 
Cubs and the Dodgers. Let's move on. I know we've been talking a while here, guys, but a lot of games to go through. Uh, Justin Steele on the mound. He got beat up a little bit in his last start. Um, 7,900. I don't think we can go after this with the Dodgers. Uh, the Dodgers, is just they're just the Dodgers, man. Um, you can always play the Dodgers. You can play them on the main slate. Definitely play them on the late slate. But um, 7,900, I think the price tag is a little bit too high here. He does have K stuff to the left side, which is good because Max Muncy is just like, I don't know, he's freaking Ted Williams. Uh, but, you know, I mentioned this uh, maybe a week or, or, or so ago that when Max Muncy gets hot, man, he's a streaky hitter and he's going to be 5,000 every damn night and you're just going to have to pay for him. And sure enough, here he is at 4,800. He's just going to hit two dingers every night. And he did it again in San Francisco in a bad matchup um, once again. So, like, this stuff is going to happen with him sometimes. When he starts seeing the baseball, uh, you have to get exposure to him, even if it's just 5% or whatever. Uh, don't forget about this guy, even in bad matchups. That said, he's probably going to strike out a crap load tonight. He still has a strikeout rate against lefties, and Steele has a good strikeout number. Um against the left side, 30%, 0.55 ISO. So I don't want to go out of my way to target a guy like Muncie or anything, but if you're playing the late slate and you're stacking the Dodgers, don't leave him off your stack because he could burn you. And But he could also win you tournaments if you play him. So that said, um, my little Max Muncie rant, rant out of uh, out of the way here, I really don't want to be playing Justin Steele. Um, I would rather go after him with some righties and guys that don't strike out because he's only got a 23% K rate. It's average. Uh, against righties, um, but this is the Dodgers once again. He's going to have a little bit of trouble throwing strike one and walking guys, and that's we do not want to mess around with that with the Dodgers because they've got so much power, and he could miss on a bad four seamer to a Max Muncie, and all of a sudden, you know, you're in a three-zero hole uh, in the first inning, and it could it's very reasonable and very possible. So uh, no thanks on a 7900 Justin Steele. Just give me the Dodgers. Cindergard uh, on the mound at 7000. I'm also not playing him. I I've rarely played him when he was with the Mets and he had good K stuff. I almost never play him anymore because he's got a 17% K rate over the last season and a half. He's not suppressing anything. He got beat up uh, in his last start as well. Um, he just doesn't have it. Just doesn't have it. And it's unfortunate because this was a really promising arm that just got hurt. And it, we just can't play him. Even at 7000 attractive price tag, Sure. Do you want to play him on the late slate? Fine. There's eight pitchers there. You gotta you gotta play some of them. Um, but this isn't really all that great a matchup against the Cubs either. You know the Cubs as of right now 335 PAs against righties this season, 18.8 percent strikeout rate uh, in aggregate. Like I don't want to go after them with a guy that is only striking out hitters at a 17 percent clip himself. Um, so no thank you. Give me some of the Cubs here on the late slate as well. I don't. I think we could probably ignore this on the main slate, but there's probably some value here from the Cubs. I mean, 4,200, Nico, that's okay. Uh, Ian Happ is fine against a guy that's not going to strike him out from the left side. 5,000, it's fine. Uh, we'll see if Seiya Suzuki is back. Um, rumor floating that uh, his oblique is okay, so uh, this is fine. It's an elevated price tag, definitely, so I'm not crazy about that. Um and paying for a guy that hasn't seen you know, raw major league pitching, even if it is Syndergaard, in a while. Bellinger back in L.A. at 3,200. Uh, it's fine. He's been okay. Mechanics are still bad. Um, but he's a playable price tag down here. So I think you could play some of the Cubs if you want. Trey Mancini's still free. Uh, Eric Hosmer, 2,800. He's still free as well. So 46 for Patty Wisdom. Uh, we're not dealing with any of that. But um, you can go after some Syndergaard here. Not my favorite main slate play, but... Uh, it's certainly a playable stack, and we can attack center guard, absolutely. Okay, so mostly offense in that game, and finally, probably mostly offense in this game as well, Austin Gomber on the mound for the Rocks in Seattle, and Marco Gonzalez for the, going for the Mariners. 5,800 for Gomber, no thank you. Uh, I think we can probably keep this short. Um, he just throws to, pitches to way too much contact, can't throw it by anybody, and... He's on the barrel, 8.5%. I mean, it's not horrible, but it's, uh, I think, above average for the slate, at least. But hard contact is really the problem here. Um, definitely to lefties, 35%. 31% to righties, so not horrible there, but 1.8 homers per nine to righties. Of course, he plays most of his games in Coors, uh, but he's still giving up a 376 Wobe and a 236 ISO. 
with an 18% K rate. You can't really fake those numbers, and you can't fake contact numbers. So concerning that he can't throw strike one, and I don't want to be dealing with that against the Mariners. Um, don't have their ownership up here, uh, right here in the sheet, but um, probably going to see a good bit of ownership on them tonight. Probably one of the more popular stacks. You can you can get to them as well. They're probably going to be, um, I mean, they're, they're definitely going to be the most popular stack on the late slate here, but expensive for sure. Julio still at 56. I like this play a lot. Um, as a matter of fact, you can play him everywhere. Ty France, 5,000, not so much at the price tag, but good hitter here. Uh, Gino at 43, like this a, a good bit as well. And Teoscar, this is one of those nights where Teoscar could hit two on you, uh, and you better have him. A.J. Pollock, don't forget about him. Cal Raleigh, if he is in the list tonight at 39. They had a day off yesterday, so we probably will be, but he hits from the bull, from both sides. Tommy Murphy against his old team as well at 2,100. Uh, fine catcher play. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it with Sam Haggerty tonight. I'm just not doing it. He's been so bad. Um, I'll probably still do it, but... He's been frustrating to play, to, to say the least. So Mariners, for sure, on the mound for them is, is Marco Gonzalez. Doesn't pitch it, like, any whiff stuff whatsoever. 13% K rate for him. Good pitcher, though. I, I like watching Marco. I've always been a big fan of his. Um, maybe because I was a big fan of, like, Greg Maddox back in the day, you know, and Tom Glavin. Reminds me a lot of Tom Glavin. Um 83.5% contact rate is way too high, so you can play some Rockies too. You want to play them on the main? Eh, probably not, but the prices are a bit more attainable here. Uh, C.J. Crone down to 5,100. This is better. Marco gives up a lot of pull power, and C.J. Crone has, certainly has a lot of that. Chris Bryant, for sure, 5,000. It's fine. Jury leading off at 3,600. It's okay from both sides. His from both sides as well. So attainable price tags here. Um... For some of these righties, Elias Diaz has been seeing the baseball pretty good. Zeke Tovar starting to come into his own a little bit. Young hitter here, but um, you know a lot of upside in the future. Definitely Ellery Montero, plenty of pop. Certainly his his biggest weakness is strikeouts. So Marco's not going to do that necessarily. He could suppress. So if you want to play some Marco on the late slate as well, I mean, he just doesn't have any upside on the on the main slate. So you'd have to do this on a short slate. But um, you can get to him with power. For sure, 179 ISO to, to the lefties, 190 ISO to the righties. Um, and he'll give up some homers. Like I said, he gives up a good bit of pull power, but he'll give up some some line drive power as well. 25% line drive rate to the lefties in particular. It's kind of a big number. So um, just offense in this late game for, for me here. Uh, mostly the Mariners, but you can play some Rockies as well. Off the board stack for sure. Uh, okay, so I think we're done um, an hour at least, or maybe an over an hour. Sorry it's so long, guys, but 12 games, it's a lot to get through here uh, with some newer pitchers and, and whatever. So we went on a little bit of a projections rant um, at the early part of the vid, so check that out. Um, and as a reminder, we will have numbers updated um, throughout the day. So keep an eye out for, for pushes to the site and to Sabersim. Um, and that said, that's the 12 gamer for Friday. Good luck everyone tonight and we'll catch you tomorrow for Saturday.